everyone. Thank you for joining today's Hangout on Air for cs for hs Today we are continuing our Innovators in CS Education series. Today we have Tracy Ruzitas from, who is a digital media teacher in New York. Um, so I'm going to get briefly started, give you a little background on Tracy, and then I'm going to hand it over to her. As always, please feel free to submit questions via the app during this hangout. Tracy is a middle school teacher at a public high school in New York City. She teaches digital media classes to 6th and 7th graders, a computer science programming elective to 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, and opens her classroom up, classroom up every day at lunch for drop-in maker space. Tracy also has a robotics club that meets after school once a week during the school year. In her digital media classes, the students explore a range of digital media concepts and the ideas are exposed to many tools and materials to assist in this exploration. Her curriculum includes animation, image manipulation, game design, conceptual, oh, computational thinking and programming concepts, and the history and social implications of computers. In the programming elective students, they have been immersed in learning and processing. Students are also learning Python and using App Inventor to create mobile computing applications. The Makerspace is open to every student every day of the week during lunch, and students have created a range of projects from Arduino-based robots with flashing LEDs to stuffed creeper dolls <laughs> with voice boxes that can record and play messages. Just recently, the addition of a 3D printer has taken the students' imaginations and project possibilities to a whole other level. Tracy was hired by the New York City Department of Education last spring as a curriculum developer for the city's software engineering pilot program that was introduced this past September in 20 city schools. Tracy was selected as a 2014 FabLearn Fellow through the Transformative Learning Technologies Lab at Stanford University. This cohort is tasked with designing and writing open source curriculum for Makerspace and Fab Labs all over the world and in collecting the data to inform other research and collecting the data to inform research about the maker's culture and the digital fabrication in education. Tracy has always had an intense interest in making things and is passionate about sharing this enthusiasm for making and inventing with her students and only wishes that there were more of her time that she could give to do all this cool stuff. So Tracy, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm looking forward to what you're going to show us today. Okay. So, <laughs> um, here I am. <laughs> uh, I have, uh, as it noted in my bio, I kind of do a number of different things here at the school I teach at. It's a public school and it's middle school kids and I feel really fortunate to be able to share all this kind of really neat stuff with them. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, talking a little bit about um, kind of where my teaching practice um, is, in what it's informed by, and then I'm also going to show a lot of examples of student work, of kind of my approaches, and I have some, a lot of visuals of um, the actual student work itself. Um, feel free, like I said, to ask questions, and definitely I'll get to the questions at the end, but if there's certain things that are relevant, um, hopefully I can answer those in between also. So I'm going to start here by... Uh, getting my screen here and of course I there we go <laughs> I practice this but hey um, let me go to my drive where is it I had it all set ah, uh, oh, I guess it's here okay I see what's happening sorry about that okay view and present and can you see, is that showing up or? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, just a sec. Let me, shoot, I should have practiced this part too. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, because uh, I think what's happening is it's on the same, uh, let's do this. Uh, okay, share screen, share screen. Uh-oh. Why is that not working? Okay, I'm sharing the screen, and now I need to go to the screen. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. This is no good. Is that showing at all? Not yet, Tracy. Ay, 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 this is no good. It's, uh, why is it not share? Well, if you want to screen share, it should give you the option, and it should do, like, a pop-out box. And yeah, then... I'm trying to do that, and it's not popping anything out. Shoot. Ay, ay, ay. Let me, let me do something else. Okay, so I'm not, I don't want that. I want share screen. Oh, I just I see that it says share screen, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing. It had before I had like a uh, a bunch of stuff up. Oh, yeah. If you click on, are you clicking on share screen, or are you just yeah. hovering over it? No, I'm just clicking on it. Nothing's happening. I had I had it come up, and now it's not coming up anymore. Oh my goodness. It's okay. Do you want to maybe do you want to ping it to me in this hangout, and then I can maybe share it for you? Okay, uh, shoot. let me um, share it with you right here. Through Drive? Oh. Yeah, it's on my Drive. Okay, let me go to my Drive and then we'll get it going. Oh my goodness. Ay, okay. ay, ay. I know, but I, I had it all. Shoot. Just a sec. This is a pain. Um, okay, just let me do this. Oh gosh. Um, what if. Go to, let me go to my Google Drive and see if I can get get it this way. I just no, that's not. I had it. Fun. Can I log out and log back in? I mean, it just it's it's like my computer's frozen here. Yeah, you can log absolutely log out and log back in, and then just rejoin this thing out. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so. Got this. Now I'm going to share this. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. okay. Start screen share. Okay. There you go. Okay. That's it. See, it, it was there. Then it. Okay. So done. And now you should see it. Yes, I do. I okay. see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. It was there. It's okay. Okay. Technology oh. can be tricky. It's okay. Here we go. We're back here. Okay. Um, so my uh, my background in terms of what I'm um, interested in, uh, what I've always kind of been focused on in terms of bringing to my teaching, is uh, things uh, Seymour Papert and Mitch Resnick. Um, I use both of them because I or talk about both of them, obviously, because they're kind of like the people that have been most involved in constructionism and, um, as Mitch calls it, uh, passion-based learning. Um, I teach Logo, Microworlds, to my students, and I also teach Scratch. And I've been doing that for a number of years. Um, and I love the way that um, the, both these programs engage kids and bring, um, kind of allow kids to have, find this entry into uh, programming and into uh, um, creating with the computer. Um, so I, uh, the, what I consider passion-based learning is connecting to students' interests, but I really enjoy pushing them and engaging them and exposing them to different things that they may not be that, um, that aware of. Um, one of the I, examples of that is the uh, processing that I'm doing this year with the kids. Um, being able to share with them um, their love of animation and then give them a tool uh, such as processing to be able to create these amazing things. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, I feel like it should be fun, but it should be hard fun. And the other thing that becomes, um, I think, is a challenge, and particularly around middle school kids, is that there's nothing necessarily easy about this stuff. But we need to, as educators, kind of try to make it engaging and relevant and accessible to our students so that they'll feel challenged, but they won't feel um, defeated. Uh, so my um, kind of, at the, at, I'm currently reading Mindstorms again, which is uh, Seymour Papert's, one of his books, which is an excellent book. Highly recommend it. And one of the things that I was just reading this week was the idea that, um, you know, a lot of times when people are thinking about working in uh, with letting kids kind of construct their own learning and their own meaning is they get misunderstood that it's not really about a free form approach. It's not really where students are left alone to their own devices, but it really you really need to support the students 
as they build their intellectual structures and they are making sense with the materials and the tools that are available to them. Um, in choosing processing this year as a point of entry, um, I was hoping to make connections to the students' interest in animation, computer graphics, and game design. So those are um, kind of the things that like I'm, I try to think about when I'm putting things together. I try to imagine um, that although they may be learning something that is difficult, that it that the approach can be somewhat uh, friendly, and that I don't want to make it boring or rote. Although those kind of things sometimes end up being, uh, you know, in life, yes, <laughs> so kids yeah. have to get a sense of that anyway. Um, the design cycle is a really important aspect of, um, I think, any kind of curriculum, um, especially computer-based or uh, computational thinking. The, uh, it's, this is a graphic that comes from the uh, Lifelong Kindergarten Group, which is the group that Mitch Resnick and Scratch uh, come, came out of, or Mitch Resnick leads, but Scratch came out of. And I think it's really important to think of uh, the design cycle and keep, be aware of the design cycle and embed that in any of the work that you're doing. Uh, one of the things that I think that computer science teachers are really fortunate about is that we already work with a hands-on curriculum. We're already working with something that is that you do, that you don't just sort of talk about and you don't just read about, but you actually construct and do. And so... Crazy? Reflect, make mistakes, debug, and hack, those are really important features, I think, of any curriculum and allow students to get deeper into it. Uh, so why did I teach, teach, choose processing? Um, I'm not sure if uh, there's a... Processing is a free application. It was created by people at MIT um, originally. things in and they run the program and they get some visual graphics and it can capture their imagination. It can make things really uh, interesting, just a click of the mouse and they can d be drawing these interesting um, visuals with different colors and things like that. So they have sort of an immediate way of getting it being engaged and then of course we work Tracy, are you still there? Yep. Okay. It's cut. It seems like the um, Wi-Fi is cutting a little bit out. Oh. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. So, okay. Do you see me? Is it that okay? Yeah. No. 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 It's totally fine. It just sometimes your voice drops. Okay. It's that's probably just me. I, okay. Okay. So approaches to lesson design. So I really think it's important to have a structured but not rigid uh, approach. Um, I don't want all the students doing the same thing, and I think it's boring for me if I see all the same thing. Um, but then we might be learning about the same concept, so it's important to understand there's a difference between, you know, doing anything, doing whatever they want, which I, you know, keep under check, but also kind of using their own imaginations and exploring it. Um, embracing the possibilities of what new technologies can offer students right now is so important because right now we're really interested and the students are really interested in making connections with physical computing. When I say physical computing, uh, we have Arduinos, we have a lot of different microprocessing boards, we have physical uh, robots and different types of robots and I think that there's so much out there and there's so many ways to make those connections and of course they all need to be programmed so there's all sorts of different languages that you can use with the with the students. So multiple approaches, multiple solutions I think is such a really um, important thing to 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 work with. Uh, so the curriculum, I'm going to talk a little bit about the processing. I'm going to show some examples from my students. Um, the uh, curriculum and ideas that uh, that I got, I used Daniel Schiffman's book, Learning Processing, and I feel like it was a great way to start. Um, it's an excellent uh, introduction book, but it's also I feel like the what how he approaches the the ideas of processing really 
made sense for my, I mean, we're talking about 11-year-olds 11, 11 and 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds, and they were really getting it. Um, I started with some unplugged activities, so this is an example of some of the work that my students did, and I'll be showing more examples of that. Um, what we did is, uh, besides just going through and figuring out the grid system and how we create um, basic shapes in processing, they then created, uh, drew a creature and the, what we were going to do, the creature was created with shapes, and then what I wanted them to do was to um, build this using uh, the processing. So you can see here the range of things. I have each of them. I was teaching about, I think I had about 35 kids in both classes total. So I had a lot of different kinds of things. You can see a creeper down there. One of the students did the creeper in black and white or in grayscale, and then they added the color. Um, another creature up in the top. And these were all just within the first um, first and second hours of, of working and processing. So they were able to really get something up on the screen that was meaningful to them and really excited. They were just running around the classroom. They, they couldn't believe that they had created this with all this all these numbers. And they typed, this was all them typing this up. It wasn't something that they copied and pasted at that point. It's amazing um, how quickly kids that age absorb stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm going to actually go back to that only because I want to show, I'm going to open up processing here. Um, I'm going to show another one that a kid did. Um, I love this. What, again, one of the great things about processing is that you, they can download this uh, application and use this at home. I should have had this open, but I didn't. Um, so one of my, this is a sixth grader, and he created, uh, let me just do this. He created this. We're actually s still working on it a little bit um, because we're going to add some conditional statements. So this is his code, and it's all sorts of big, long things. And so we're going to run this and know what he did. And we, what we did is we started adding the interactivity. So the things I showed you first on that screen were the... Um, where before we started talking about how we can add mouse event or event act interactivity and in particular mouse events. So on this one is using the mouse X and mouse Y and it's taking a while to load because here we go. So here's his, this is Spencer, he's a sixth grader just learning computer, uh, so he did this where this is all controlled by the mouse, the X and the Y uh, position of the mouse. What we're going to be doing with this, and where he's actually working on it now, he has another version, where he's going to uh, constrain the way that the eyes are so that they don't go completely off. So he's using conditional statements to do that. And the same with the mouth. So it goes, it works to wherever, whatever he's doing. So I thought that was, uh, that's actually pretty cool. Um, I'm going to show another one here. Uh, this is, let's see here. Uh, okay, let me do this one here. This is, I'm not quite sure, I think this might be another uh, one that's not interactive, but this is one that someone did yesterday. And they just, this was just done, like I said, in, um, okay, so this is another little creature. Um, you know, figuring out this little unicorn, this is going to be a unicorn, it's got his little horn up here, but these are the kind of things that are, um, you know, it's not easy to get that little guy right up there in the right place and these little eyes in the right place. And so it's a lot of really cool things that are kind of happening, I feel like, when they're working with this. And I'm going to show another, just one more here. This is another, this is an eighth grader. And uh, I'm hoping that it's the right, which one is it? No problem. And for those users that joined late, you're using process, the program processing. Okay, so let's see if this is the one. They, they all handed them in to me yesterday. They were working on them. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is the one. This guy, uh, Brave, is one of my eighth grade students. Oh, actually, this is Mateo's. Okay. Okay, so we play, and I'm not quite sure what I need to be doing here because I, but as you can see, he's got some, uh, some images he's put, and he's got a timer going, and he's got some, uh, you know, contact and obviously some if statements. So there's like a really a lot of different things that he's come up with. He wrote all this stuff and he figured it out and he's working uh, a lot of times the um, 
kids have done a lot of stuff in Scratch before. So these are specifically kids that have done a lot of the gravity things in Scratch and they figured things out that way. So it's kind of neat to see them bring the, that those concepts over and then kind of try to work them out in this way um, which is obviously a lot different from just the block based stuff but it has the same concepts behind it um, so okay so that's uh, that's that let's go to um, I'm going to move on to I'm just going to put this into present so another thing that's been really great is I've been uh, let's go to here, is that um, I have a Raspberry Pi, oops, went too fast, a Raspberry Pi that I brought in for my students, and we finally got it up and running. Um, it just, it wasn't that it took, a, was hard, it was just more in terms of time. Um, and we are now working in with Python. So there is a RAS, I got the curriculum and the inf or the information from someone in the UK that has uh, put together um, using the Raspberry, the Python, um, sorry, the Raspberry Pi Minecraft for Raspberry Pi, getting it backwards. And you can use Python to control it, to build your blocks, to create your uh, work, etc. So got a few kids that you can see here, they're opening the Python shell, they're down in this area here, um, I don't know that they've typed anything up yet, but basically what they're doing is there's there's ways that you can get into the when working with the API and using Python, and they're really enjoying that. And um, just started it, but they keep coming into the lab, and they want to be in here all the time doing it. And it's kind of neat to watch them. Another thing I really love about this is that. Um, these are, again, middle school kids who, you know, you've got another kid walking down the hallway and they're kind of like, whoa, that's kind of neat. What are you doing in there? You're playing a game. And then they're like, yeah, we're playing a game, but we're also programming it using, like, command line and things like that. So it's kind of neat, kind of neat stuff. Um, I actually asked some of my students uh, this afternoon what they thought about that, if they could, they had any thoughts. And they... They said that they found it easier to have something that they are familiar with or have an interest in as a starting point. Um, I think that um, anyone might agree that Python, although it might be a, uh, not a particularly difficult language, that it can be uh, not as interesting possibly to a middle school kid if you're just doing it. That doesn't mean that there's that some middle school kids would certainly be interested in it, but that there's a way to engage it when, again, there's this visual or this sort of... Um, uh, uh, immediate kind of something that happens when they do it and sometimes you can do that in Python certainly with um, images and you can do it with numbers and math and things like that but this is just another way to approach it and um, students are so motivi motivated to find the solutions and solve problems when they have those personal connections I they don't usually ask me to come over when they're trying to figure stuff out for this kind of stuff and, and I'm perfectly happy with that um, and so it's kind of a nice thing because a lot of the, a lot of students these days are more than happy to raise their hand and ask for help when they really don't need it. <laughs> so right. it's kind of nice to see that happening. Uh, okay, so I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Um, I do a makerspace. Uh, a year ago, I decided that I wanted to have a makerspace in my classroom. Uh, don't have any time in the school day. So I thought, well, when can I do it? At lunch. So what can I do? I can bring in a bunch of my stuff from my house because I have a bunch of junk at home. <laughs> and so I brought in some real basic things, and we started from there. I have since gotten some grants. I've gone through Donors Choose, and we've uh, really um, been able to beef up our, our uh, stuff, our, our supplies. Um, but we have a lot of really basic things. Um, some of the jitterbug, the picture that's on the screen right now is a jitterbug robot. Really fun to make, really easy, but um, really again, teach the kids a lot about circuitry, about electronics. They solder. They don't have to solder for this, but they do. Um, we've been doing Arduino robots. I'm going to show a pretty intense one after that one of my students has been working on since um, the fall. Squishy circuits is a great way to get involved in some of this stuff. It's really easy and you can light up LEDs and um, put stick wires in there. 3D modeling, I'm really fortunate to have gotten some funding for a 3D printer and the kids have been off and running in terms of um, designing and creating their, their own uh, work. 
Uh, we're doing things that attach to robots. We're building robots. We're creating Lego and Mindstorm robots that have 3D printed wheels and, and servos and all sorts of fun things. We're doing a lot of e-textiles, so we're um, the kids are being able are sewing up things and then adding lights and batteries and switches. Uh, we made some glow bottles, which is something I found this instructable. And a bunch of friends and I, we did these where they can actually use LEDs and um, uh, soldered wires and things, and you use it in a an empty um, bottle. And what you can do is you can go into a dark room, uh, click on the uh, the bottle lights the LED, and then you can draw with it in a dark room. So that's kind of pretty cool. Um, and we did a crystal radio. And the cool thing about the crystal radio is that one of uh, my students uh, 3D printed the container. The instructions we had for the crystal radio let you use a, uh, or I told you to use a toilet paper tube. But so what he did is he created our own uh, tube. He even put the words computer school on it, which is the, the name of our school. And then uh, we printed that out. So our crystal radio has is uh, really pr pretty nice. Um, I have a number of different types of robots. I love being able to um, allow kids to see, to, to sort of choose and, and, and invent with what they are interested in. Um, this is one of my uh, uh, one of my students, Olivia. She uh, used a hummingbird uh, microprocessor that you can see in the back. And what she did is she created everything else. And you can't see it in this picture, but the, um, the there's this is a platform that this that this uh, the cupcake is mounted on. These are just things that she created out of um, uh, uh, fabric, LEDs, you can see, pipe cleaners, and uh, cardboard. And, and she needed to have some sort of hinge or way to mount the cupcake. So what we did is she went into Tinkercad and she designed a small little hinge. We printed it out and it's not, I don't have a picture of that one, but that's how, the, how it's, and she hot glue gunned that and it was perfect. Um, and then she programmed this to do different things, of course. Um, this is, uh, to move back to the cupcake robot, you can use um, a number of different things to program it. We use Snap, but I also have some kids that are working with the Finch robot. This is a Finch robot here. And they are using the Raspberry Pi and Java to start doing it, so they're kind of working on that. It's a work in progress. And these particular ones, we use Snap, which is a block-based program like Scratch. And uh, the Finch robots are a lot of fun also. And they open up, you can program it with Python, Java, the Alice. There's all sorts of different um, opportunities. So it allows the kids to learn other um, more advanced programming languages also. Uh, simple circuits. So in Makerspace, again, we can really, this is a robot. <laughs> and it's a great, these are really fun. We uh, found the basic uh, project on Instructables. There's so many different projects and then kind of made our own depending on what the materials we had at hand. I love the fact that I'm um, sort of getting these kids like I love this kind of thing where you try to what what can we make? What do, what materials do we have on, on hand that we can use to construct our own robots or we, our own um, machines? And so I try to have as, as many pieces of uh, metal or you know whatever cardboard whatever it may be that they can use hot glue gun together and design and, and test and fix and figure out their work um, this was also a great way to work with circuitry because um, the way that uh, direct current works obviously goes in from high to low in terms of the current and so in this case they had both of the uh, battery or the I'm sorry, the wires to the motors hooked up in the same way, so they were spinning in the same direction. So we were able to kind of troubleshoot and figure out what direction they might need to go and then how they needed to be resoldered re so that the, 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 from the plus to the minus was going in the directions they needed it to go. So it was kind of like a very, really great hands-on lesson for uh, this kind of stuff. Um, here's a picture here of two of my students, my sixth graders working. Uh, as I said, kids have an amazing capacity for doing incredible things. Um, they really do, and as teachers, we really need to remember to give them that opportunity because when some other teachers walk by and see the stuff they're doing, it's like, wow, really? Um, these kids are soldering, and they're really great solderers, but they're also putting together these incredible electrical circuits, and, and, and they're working, so it's kind of neat. 
Um, and not only putting them together, but designing them. I think that's important also. Here's a couple more of my students that show up at Makerspace. Um, they, show, they have their little LED lights in this. I think this was a, a squishy circuit day. Not quite sure what she's, but she's holding up the LEDs that are all lighting. And they had a lot of fun doing that. Um, so that was, that's another one. Um, this is uh, kind of a, a view of, of what my Makerspace might look like on any day of the week. It's open at lunch. It's a drop-in. Um, the kids come up during their lunch time. I try to facilitate it so that they can uh, either be working at a computer programming. So a lot of kids are doing this. You don't see the front of the room where I have a huge other table. So I have two other tables that kids were working at and then in the middle of the room. So some kids are doing um, some hands-on making. They're, some of the kids are working on scratch or programming, and it's a range of activities. Uh, the only thing they have to, my only rule is they have to be making something. So we have our, our, uh, our mantra being the computer, we program the computers, the computers don't program us. Uh, so a couple of ideas of some of the things I do. We've got, this is uh, one of my students, Benji, right now. He's just finishing this up, or actually he's just starting it, but he, he did he worked really hard on it, it's working. He came in and he wanted to make the sonic screwdriver from Doctor Who. This is the kind of stuff that I love in Makerspace. I feel it's really different in some ways from the classroom um, situation when you're sort of working with 30 kids and you really have to, you know, there are the constraints of curriculum and there are the constraints of, of you know, making sure that the kids are coming away with an understanding of specific things. Um, to contrast that in Makerspace where they are still learning some very important things, obviously, but it's a different uh, approach and a kind of a different way. Um, and a different motivation. So when he came in, he wanted to, like I said, create the sonic screwdriver from Doctor Who. So we kind of talked about it a little bit. He knew he wanted to 3D print a shell, but he also knew that he had it to have. He wanted an LED, and he wanted a switch. And I'm not a big Doctor. I not that I wouldn't want to be a big Doctor Who fan, but I don't know a lot about it. My students are big Doctor Who fans. They're always talking about this stuff. So he had explained to me uh, a little bit about it, but we decided that we would create the insides first and so we were able to and again this kind of goes back to the whole design cycle where we he sketched it out on paper uh, we think about what you know what we're doing we kind of put it together he we uh, made sure it worked by attaching he had made one a couple of solders and this was his first time soldering but they were great then I showed him the alligator clip so that we could kind of clip it together and he then uh, tested it to make sure that he had the components in the right order before he soldered it. And so then he was going to solder. So he has this done. Now what he's, his next task is he's designing the shell for it. So we felt, or he, we both felt, and he, he did that, it was better to start with the inside and then design the outside because he wasn't sure what the inside was going to have to look like. So again, these are the kinds of things um, I just think are really so in, uh, engaging for the kids and they both relate to both the sort of computational thinking, the computational process, um, computer science, they do a lot of programming with the Arduino and the sketches for the Arduino are very similar to processing so that's a nice uh, connection right there for them. Um, so I, this, uh, a while back I asked some of my students for some, because um, I, I basically think my students can really, they, they really kind of tell, talk about this stuff much better than I can. And I was, um, I just love the, the things that they were kind of talking about in terms of makerspace. Um, making is the future. Uh, makerspace is really, really fun. When you're making something, you get to put your own imagination into it. It is yours. Uh, being able to construct and create physical and digital things is more meaningful and better trains us to be prepared for our futures in the real world. Much more than just copying and notes and memorizing information the teachers provide for us. That's what one of my eighth graders, I, I kind of love the contrast between kind of his very succinct uh, eighth grade uh, comment. Uh, making expands our creativity. There's no end to what you can make. Um, Rudy, uh, this was something that he told me uh, once uh, was at the beginning of the year when I, for my robotics after school and he was handing the robots and the boxes back to me after the first day and he just looked up at me and said you have opened an entire new world for me and that was pretty amazing I was that was pretty cool um, Matteo came up with the motto of makerspace one of the very first days and it's nothing is impossible in makerspace and uh, Sean who I'm going to show his, his uh, 
robot here in, in just a sec. <clears throat> uh, I love the way he just says, everything you touch is an adventure. Um, I think that's the last slide I have. I'm going to go back to, uh, oops, am I still there? You're still here. Let me uh, go to the, not chat, what do I want to go to? I want to go to, do I just need to, I'm on screen share, right? Yeah, you're on screen share now, you just need to close the screen. I just have to click on, it'll go back, is that what I yeah. do? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I'm just fast. No, I just want to show. I'm going to show. Um, I just love this. This is a Sean's. Uh, I don't know how much you can see. Let me make my thing bigger here. He he was actually. Uh, you probably can't see all of it. This is a robot that he's been working on. It's going to be programmed with the Arduino. They were had it in the hallway today. It, it works. It runs. Um, he did all this work. He's got transistors. He's got some light sensors that we're going to program. The Arduino gets hooked up right here, and we're programming it. It's not on here right this second because I'm pulled. So he's got it, all this fantastic stuff, and it's awesome. So you know, it, it, it's that's the way that physical computing I find can really um, be connected to uh, computer programming and really give the kids a another level that they can go to, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so I think that might be, is that good? <laughs> yeah, that's great. So I do have one question. If someone's interested in bringing a makerspace into their school, how do you suggest they go about doing that? Um, okay, so that's a great question. And, and I, the way I did it, like I said, I said, you know what, I want to do this. I really want to do it. And so I did. I was fortunate enough that I'm in a situation where I don't want to say no one pays attention. Of course they do, but I I could just kind of do it. I brought my own stuff in. I did do a donors choose, and I I'm, I donors choose is an excellent way to get supplies. Um, you can also reach out through your. I have another friend that works in a public school um, here in uh, New York, and when they told they did a uh, worked through the code for a, uh, the code dot the code for an hour. Last oh, fall, and they did such. They loved it, and the students loved it so much that what happened is the principal's like, "Wow, this is fantastic!" So now they're doing, they're connecting all the STEM stuff, the STEAM stuff, and so they're getting some funding from within the school also, and they're going to get a 3D printer, and the PA is behind it because the kids just really had enjoyed it. So, you know, there's there's definitely ways, um, and there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of uh, if you are on Twitter, there's a hashtag MakerEd, and that's a great one to follow. Um, and we're, I know for part of the FabLearn Fellowship is like to try to put a, together a lot of um, curriculum and, and lessons and design some um, materials so that teachers can really embrace this and, and not find it like it's a huge hurdle just to get into, into it initially. So... I do have another question. So is computer science a required part of the curriculum out in New York? I know in California, computer science isn't part of the curriculum. No, it's not. In fact, it's not only not part of it, but in the public schools, it's, it's, there's a lot of schools that don't even have computers. We're fortunate enough to have computers here, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to, when I came here, to be able to design a curriculum that I was wanting to and what I was interested in. Um, one of the reasons I could do that is because it's not required. <laughs> and so it's in my school, though I was lucky enough that it was a class that all of the 6th and 7th took. So the 6th and 7th graders all took the class, but it's not a, so when I say it's not required, in our school it's required, but it's not a, um, as they call a core subject or a subject that makes, you know, that they have to pass. Um, the SEP program, the Software Engineering Pilot Program that's in 20 uh, schools this that started this fall that is something that the, the, the impetus behind that was that hopefully at one point it would become a required or a recognized class and that the people that are behind that are working really really hard to get computer science um, teachers to, to, to have that as a, um, a license area and to get some and to, to working to have that kind of credit, you know, to, to recognition. So it is something that people are working really, really hard towards. And in New York City there's a lot of different impetus behind it. There's another organization called the Computer Science or Computer Science New York City. And they are 
uh, they have a number of uh, monthly meetups that they want and to again share all this kind of information and make sure that people are understanding the importance of it these days. Okay. Do any of our viewers have any questions? Let's give them a minute to submit, and if they don't, Tracy, then you and I can call it an afternoon. Okay. <laughs> so, did this, the students really like building the robots? They enjoy yeah, that? Yeah, they do a lot, but they love a lot of the different things. I have, um, actually, I could even show uh, a dream house, really. That's one thing I actually wanted to, to show. Let me, they work in, um, for people that aren't familiar with um, logo, oops, that's not. I'm going to just look for dream houses. Uh, there are some great, uh, I wish I could remember which. Um, so they do these uh, dream house projects, and I'll share my screen once I bring it up. Where And this is logo. So the way that it's done in logo is, uh, just have to bring this up, is, um, it's, it's, we use the Microworlds pro program, mm -hmm. and the kids love this, and they code. Let's see. I'm gonna. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, share the screen. Just a sec. Okay. Do this really quickly now that I can. Oops. Oh, I'm gonna just do that same thing. It's like it only wants to do it once. Oh. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. I might have to. I can, well, should I refresh or does it matter? You can refresh really quickly, that's fine. She's just going to show us something in, that one of our students designed, and if you guys have any questions, please feel free to submit. We only have a few minutes left with Tracy today. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay, let me do that. Okay, so I'm going to do this, start screen share. So let's do that. Come on. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay, so you see that? Mm hmm Okay. So the dream micro worlds is, is they love it. It's the turtle, they move the turtle around. And one of the projects I give them, and this was a way for them to learn about procedures, um, is that they write individual uh, uh, procedures for uh, different shapes. So they have all these different shapes. They've written these. This is like set position, uh, forward 100, left, and we, you know, this is the the sort of after learning or working in micro worlds for two months. They usually I teach the kids uh, twice a week, so it's really not a lot of time. It's not as much as I would love. Um, so they figure all this, lots of geometry, lots of Cartesian plane kind of stuff, and then what they can do is they draw the house. And so what they're doing is they demolish the house. So their purpose is to sort of have one button that has in it, and you can sort of see here, it the main house procedure that is made up of a number of sub-procedures. So this is a great programming exercise that allows them to think about encapsulation, to think about um, figuring out, you know, working from the, the pieces of the structure and then how you would put them all together, besides, of course, just the basic um, idea of, of sequence and programming and, and uh, uh, error and troubleshooting and all that kind of fun stuff. And this is, like I said, this is one example. They've got tons. I mean, their houses are amazing. They're all sorts of crazy things that they, uh, that they work on. So... Uh, so I just wanted to show that. So that's that's micro worlds, and I love that for um, for uh, t working with the kids. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So it looks like the audience doesn't have any other questions. So, but if anything comes up after the fact, they can okay. reach out to me through the Google for Education page, and then I can reach out to you for an answer. Yeah, no problem. No well, problem. Well, thank you, Tracy, for your time today. I really appreciate it, and I hope that I learned a lot today, and it's great to see what you're doing with your students, and, I hope, and I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as well. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Tracy. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.